Welcome to episode 61. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and you're listening to Who Did That Voice, where we take an in-depth look at voiceovers. Finally, warmer weather is here, and there is no better time than right now to book your vacation getaway with 3D Travel Company. Head on over to our website at www.whodidthatvoice.co and click the Book Now button on the left-hand side. They give a complimentary quote so you can get an idea of what it will cost to take your summer vacation. For a limited time, Who Did That Voice listeners can receive a Disney gift card for qualifying Disney and Universal trips, booked and traveled by the end of 2017. Hurry and book today so you can travel away. Welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at voiceover. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Hey, you guys, this is a special shout out to all my listeners around the world. Who Did That Voice is now heard in over 78 different countries, and I can't thank you guys enough. Here in the USA and abroad, thank you for listening to Who Did That Voice. Keep listening and sharing with your friends. Hey, all you Marvel and Spider-Man fans out there. Who Did That Voice is doing an entire month with cast and crew from the 1994 Spider-Man The Animated Series, which aired on Fox Kids. You won't want to miss the month of June on Who Did That Voice. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today is part two with John Simper. Today's special guest was the writer, story editor, and producer on the 1994 Spider-Man The Animated Series, which aired on Fox Kids. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I know your time is very precious. I just wanted to go over a couple things with you, or for for the listeners. Um, you know, you've been able to work on amazing shows besides Spider-Man, like Static Shock, The Jetsons, uh, Scooby-Doo, DuckTales. You've mentioned J.J. the Jet Plane, uh, Clifford the Big Red Dog, Extreme Ghostbusters, The Incredible Hulk, The Animated Show, uh, The Animated Fraggle Rock, Super Friends, Kiki's Delivery Service, just to name a few of the amazing projects you've been uh, a part of and an influence on. And, and in fact, with Kiki's Delivery Service, I believe you actually wrote the uh, American script for uh, for that movie when it was uh, done here in the U.S. Is that correct? Yeah, I did the. I started with a very pidgin English um, uh, translation script, and then there was also Carl Maycheck's translation script, which was which was uh, good for its day, but but it lacked nuance. Uh, and also, um, uh, one of my concerns was I didn't want to do the 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 standard thing of um, the character's lips flap and then the words don't match the lip flap. So uh, that <laughs> yeah. always drove me crazy, you know. Um, yeah. And there was one there was one line in uh, Laputa that uh, Maycheck had written. It was something like, why are you holding that gun that you are looking at me so fiercely and holding? I mean, it was really it was, you know, that, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. So um, the challenge was to make it a very colloquial and to make it look like, um, in fact, look like it was animated in English. And I, I think we accomplished that. I had loved Miyazaki for many years. I used to go get the uh, laser discs, the, the, the all Japanese laser discs. So we'd watch these things. We had no idea what was going on, but they were just so beautiful. So getting to do two of his films was really kind of cool. Absolutely. I have three quick things, John, and I'll let you go. Uh, the one is, you know, Nick Fury, the helicarrier is crashing to the ground. And he says, uh, you know, regarding Electro, he says he brought down S.H.I.E.L.D. with only a gesture, gesture, heaven help us all. And that mm. to me was just epic. Like those words <laughs> ring in my ears. And I'm thinking, this is so cool. I'm like, I've seen these Avenger movies that have come out and I'm like, they fought a lot of villains and not one villain has just been able to, you know, blow all the helicarriers out of the sky like that. And I'm going, dude, I think this animated series, they could learn a lot from that in the feature films they're making because like Electro was awesome. And the World War II tie in for me has always been a huge aspect. So mm -hmm. Captain America, uh, Red Skull, and then Electro being Red Skull's son. I just love mm -hmm. the way it all tied in and all these retro heroes from back in the day and some of the voice actors that portrayed the um, Six Forgotten Warriors were some of the most iconic from original Spider-Man series and other Marvel projects and DC projects in the day, uh, yeah. you know, like Spider-Man and his amazing friends and such. But, um, you know, real quick, what kind of advice would you have to someone who might consider getting into this crazy business of being a writer or uh, a producer or getting into the kind of work that you do, John? Before I get to that, um, let me go back a bit because you mentioned the uh, the bringing down of the of the shield. Yeah. I actually remember when we were in the writers' room, 
and um, we were beating out that particular story, and we had suddenly gone up against a wall. And I and I just I turned to the writers and I said, "Well, let's just let's just bring down the helicarrier." <laughs> and I, re I I remember Jim Krieg was in the room, and he went, "Oh my God, <laughs> I never would have thought of that." Um, and I thought that was pretty funny that uh, that. Um, we had those moments where, where you know, you suddenly realized you could do these things, and it was really kind of exciting. That was one of the few scripts that we actually, I didn't normally beat out stories in a room full of writers. I, I can't think of anything more annoying, quite frankly. <laughs> um, but um, that was one where we actually did like a traditional writer's room, and everybody got together, and we all just kind of worked on it, and it worked out really well. You mentioned earlier the, uh, the Spider-Man and his robot. Yeah, there were two two episodes, and and in one episode, somebody made mention of the Spider Man having a robot, and that was actually that alluded to the uh, Japanese Spider Man series, which I had seen one or two episodes of. Okay, um, and he had had a giant robot, and somebody said that as a joke. Somebody said, "Wouldn't it be cool if if you know if the if the rich Spider Man had a giant robot? Let's just throw that in." <laughs> and then they went off and wrote that script and then when it came time to do the the sequel i thought you know or the second part i thought well let's just show the giant robot and i remember that um the writers who had worked on the first part when we screened many months later because there's like a six seven eight month gap between writing something and actually seeing it on screen oh wow uh, and it's a long time. And so <laughs> uh, i invited them all over when we watched those final episodes they were all over at my house and um, on came the robot. And I remember that the writers who had worked on the first part, they weren't aware of the fact that we had actually animated the robot. Oh, wow. That's awesome. <laughs> and they were like, oh, my God, there's the robot. We didn't know you had done it, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, I loved moments like that. Um, yeah. Anyway, getting back to your, your other question about uh, what advice I would give to writers. You know, I, I'm... I don't know that I can really give advice to writers anymore because it's such a strange industry now. Uh, I don't know. It's hard for me to even know where the industry is anymore. You know, right now I'm freelancing on a show that's going to end up on Netflix. Okay. Uh, called RoboZuna, um, which means nothing now. But, you know, a year from now when it's on the air, then you'll, you might remember. Yeah. Um, so I'm working on my second script for them right now. Uh, you know, it. I don't know. I could say all the usual things like, you know, come out here with grit and determination and do your job and blah, blah, blah. But it's it's just a crazy industry now. There's so much going on. And at the same time, um, it's hard to know where the core of the industry is. And so obviously, if you get to write a Star Wars movie or something, or if you're on staff over at Disney working on one of the one of the series, you know, then then obviously you've accomplished something. But back when I was writing if you were working at Hanna-Barbera, then you had made it. Yeah. If you were working at Marvel Productions, which, which uh, formerly had been to Patty Freeling, but it became Marvel Productions, then, you know, you were on staff on a, on a, on a, in, a in a company that made a bunch of shows. Uh, Marvel did, uh, Marvel Productions made all the Hasbro stuff. So you had an office, you sat there, you came in, it was nine to five, you did your job. You know, now people might work on a show and then they're off the show and they might not work again. Um, or the show, you know, it might be on Netflix. I don't know who's going to see it. You know, maybe some, maybe a lot of people will see it. Maybe not. Has has a single animated show on a streaming service really clicked with big in, in a big time with the American public? I mean, has there been on an Amazon or a Netflix? Has there been a SpongeBob SquarePants? Mm, I don't or, know. Maybe. I don't know. You know, I don't either. You yeah, know, I mean, that's a good question. You know, yeah. So I don't know where the industry is anymore. And therefore, I can't advise what you should do. If you really burn with a passion to write, then um, come out here and write and try to make a buck. You know, I've, I've never written a spec anything. I from the day I first started writing until now, I've always been paid. Um, so I consider that my mark of success is that I've been able to support myself quite well being a writer, but I don't know if that option is available anymore Yeah, uh, yeah. because everything's so fragmented and so crazy. And, uh, and I wonder, I wonder where the, you know, the future SpongeBob SquarePants are going to come from because 
Um, I don't I don't know that uh, that a lot of those series that are being made right now are going to gain any traction. You know, I have no idea. Well, it, t it totally makes sense. The industry has changed a lot. And, you know, now we get shows that come out and they release every episode on day one on Netflix or Hulu and you binge watch it and you're done in 10 minutes, you know, or whatever. And it's just, right. it's a different world. You know, it's not like, Hey, I have to wait every week to see an episode or I have to wait a year for the next set or whatever, you know? So I can understand where you're coming from with your perspective of it's kind of hard to know where the industry is for somebody new coming into it. Um, yeah. but I really appreciate you sharing that, um, uh, real quickly, I wasn't going to touch on this, but you did mention cyborg with the DC comics and you are writing mm -hmm. the new cyborg comics, which is super fantastic. Um, I know Thank for you. you, that has to be amazing to be a part of another wonderful franchise that you grew up loving DC comics. Um, and to be a part of that writing cyborg, Victor Vic stone, which he's a super cool character. And I think he's really come into his own in the years, uh, since his creation and, uh, for you to be able to be a part of that i know that you're breathing life into this character that's going to have long lasting effects well yeah thank you um and you know thanks for mentioning it uh, cyborg is being a lot of fun uh i did start out originally reading dc comics so during all of my childhood up until i became a teenager it was all dc yeah uh, and um cyborg is is uh is a fun character to be writing right now because he's about to be in the big justice league movie which i'm sure they're hoping is going to be a blockbuster absolutely so i'm once again handling a very important property i've been so lucky in my life because um i have not i have not labored in obscurity i have always worked with major major properties i've worked for really major guys like jim henson and george lucas and uh stan lee it's fun to be at the forefront, you know, it's, it's <laughs> what I, I went through a long period where I really wasn't doing anything because I didn't want to, I I'd kind of burned out Yeah. and you'd walk the floors of, of the San Diego comic-con and you'd think, my God, there's so much stuff being generated right now. Yeah. How can any of this stand out? And, um, and now once again, I'm handling a character that is, that is a standout character because of a it being dc and then b this giant movie that's coming out so you yeah. know i'm in the i'm in the room with all the guys that are the real movers and shakers of <laughs> of this uh of, of the zeitgeist right now and yeah. i'm i'm very lucky i've been here before i don't know how many more times i'll get to be here again but i'm here again right now and i'm very uh, i'm very thankful it's fun to be to be at the forefront of uh, of all of this craziness Absolutely, John. Thank you so much for diving into that a little bit. It's super amazing that you've been a part of it, and I just wanted to touch on it. Uh, regarding Spider-Man, I wish the show had in some ways kind of continued because it is so amazing. The animation's amazing. Uh, the futuristic weapons they use, the blasters and everything. I just, I wish some of the movies would kind of learn from what you did and kind of take that on, that we like what we saw and we want more of it. But, um, but oh, it was... You know what? I, I have to jump in and say one thing because you mentioned yeah. the blasters. Yeah. And I do, I do this in every interview. I give. We did not have so much censorship on Spider-Man the animated series. There's there's a myth that has cropped up around the series and uh, and I I'm probably the one that started it <laughs> because um I used to go to uh, conventions back in the early days back before the internet. I would go to conventions and and for comedy relief I would read some of the broadcast standards and practices notes that we would get. Um, and then I gave an interview many years ago where I said, you know, we get all these funny broadcast standards and practices notes. And 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 somehow that translated into we were the only cartoon show getting broadcast standards and practices notes. And we were the <laughs> only cartoon show being told what we could and couldn't do. And there, and so now, there, you know, the, kind of one of the uh, voodoo myths about uh, Spider-Man the Animated Series is we had all this censorship and oh my God, we used laser rifles and we didn't use real guns and blah, 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 blah. Well, the reality is uh, laser rifles, rifles are cooler than real guns. And we Absolutely. did do an <laughs> we did do an episode that had a real gun, which was one where R Robbie Robertson's son, Randy, got a hold of a real gun. His service gun, uh, service weapon. I, Absolutely. And yeah. people say, well, no one ever died on your show. Well, no one died in any Saturday morning show, it, you know? <laughs> yeah. It, you know, there was no blood. Well, there's no blood in any Saturday morning show. You, did you ever see Wolverine actually hurt anybody with his claws? And, no. and you know, in all those episodes of the X-Men. Um, and then they frequently point to Batman. And there was a bunch of stuff that Batman did in the first season before the censors kind of came down on that series. 
Um, but it's, you know, it, it's a different show. The guns were still very stylized, even though they looked like guns. And it, it was a different, it, it had a, you know, a film noir kind of thing. We did not have so much censorship on Spider-Man. It's a myth. I hate it. I fight it every time I do an interview. And so thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, bring it up once again. <laughs> well, you're welcome. I didn't think it was for cens censorship. I just thought y'all were going for a different futuristic kind of approach. Um, yeah. That was my perspective of it because it was just super unique. Um, and the blasters were just like so ahead of their time in, in some regards, I think, you know, kind of Star yeah, Wars. -ish, of course. You know? Of course. So. I mean, nobody goes to George Lucas and says, you shouldn't, you, you should have used real swords. <laughs> you know, why didn't you use real swords? You know, yeah. gee, that's a, you had so much censorship, censorship on Star Trek, on uh, Star Wars. Um, no, the reality is we were looking for something that would be interesting. One of the uh, raps that the show gets from the, from the uh, so much censorship crowd is, um, well, you didn't have Spider-Man socking people in the face a lot. He didn't hit people. Well, that's me. I, you know, I didn't believe that conflict, conflict resolution should be demonstrated to young children in the form of people hitting other people in the face. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, he had webbing. He had all kinds of interesting things that he could do. Why would I resort to him smacking somebody in the face? <laughs> Absolutely. You well, know, John, so that's, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 that's okay. I was going to say, so that's, that's the whole deal on that. And yeah. And, I always do that when I give these interviews because I hope that these interviews will hopefully live on a bit and oh, yeah. uh, and people people will get the word. So thank oh. you. Hey, you're very welcome, John. The last question I have for you, and I will let you go, is what is the legacy that you want to leave behind? Well, I never really thought about it that much um, until recently, uh, and I suppose that's that's the normal course of events when you start to get a bit older. I don't know. You know, it's a good question. Uh, I guess I'm very proud of the animated series. It has lasted far longer than I would have imagined that it should have. Um, you know, it's it's not shot in high def and it's not shot in the in the aspect ratio of things today. So it comes on, it looks like it was shot during a different era and yet still people are watching it. So I'm very excited about that. I, most of my career I've just taken it day to day uh, and I've enjoyed working with people that inspired me. So um, that's part of it. Um, I, I guess just to be remembered for having done some really cool stuff that affected people like yourself. When you when you talk about a moment in Spider-Man that I remember thinking up. Yeah. And I think, you know, and this happens a lot because uh, I'll, I'll usually when I go to conventions, I'll I'll meet up with guys roughly your age who grew up on the series and they remember all the little details. To me, it's just like yesterday. A lot of the stuff I put in. <laughs> yeah. So when you, you know, when you talk about bringing down Shield, for instance, um, I remember thinking that up in the room, and I remember a lot of these little things. And at that time, we didn't have the internet, so you'd put stuff out there, and you didn't know whether anyone got it or not. You know, I was, I was very, I was not well liked by my bosses because I was constantly fighting for little moments like that, that they just didn't understand. They didn't get why those things were important. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they had a different show in mind that's maybe a little closer to the kind of goofy show for young kids that, that they're doing with Spider-Man now. And an argument can be made that, yeah, that kind of show works for very young kids. But I, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to let the fans down. And so I was always pushing to do things a certain way and they were always pushing back and I would and I would sometimes I just do them. They'd say, Don't do that. You know, and I'd say, oh, Okay, I won't, and then I'd do it. And then they'd <laughs> they'd come back and they'd be real angry with me and you'll never work in this town again, you know. And um uh and that's cool. Um what what matters to me now is when I run into guys your age and they say, Oh my god, when you did that thing and you know, I will I'll never forget it. You know, when you killed the water-based Mary Jane, you know, that was one of the most dramatic moments I've ever seen on television. Those kinds of things are very rewarding. Yeah. So I, I, I like to think that my legacy is that those moments will continue shocking people and surprising them and delighting them. And then somewhere down the line, they'll say, well, you know, who is behind all that? And then my name will crop up somewhere in there. Uh, and uh, and that'll, you know, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. 
Absolutely, John. Well, thank you so very much for your valuable time today. I really appreciate you coming on the show and speaking with me about some of the amazing things you've worked on, but especially Spider-Man. Well, thank you, Trent, for having me on. And this was really a lot of fun. And now I have to go write. This is for future reference this, for, for, for historians. I'm currently writing issue 12, I think, of uh, Cyborg, and I'm so far behind, it's ridiculous. So I'm going to dash off. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to try to get this script in today so that it'll... Uh, so so in, in the future, when collectors are trying to figure out why this issue made no sense whatsoever, it's because I was horribly late and I just got it in as quickly as possible. <laughs> oh, John, thanks so much. Would you just give us a closeout today? Hey, this has been John Semper on Who Did That Voice? And you'll never guess who's doing my voice. It's me. Holy moly. Uh, I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you have enjoyed the show. And uh, hopefully we'll meet up again soon. Well, everyone, I sure hope you enjoyed today's episode with John Simper, the writer, story editor, and producer from the 1994 Spider-Man the Animated Series. And if you did, please find me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram by searching Who Did That Voice. I would love to hear from you. You know, a question you might ask yourself is, where can I listen to Who Did That Voice? That's an excellent question. You can hear us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, TuneIn Radio, YouTube, and our website at www.whodidthatvoice.co. Click the Episodes tab and listen away. Well, everyone, that's all the time we have for this episode. Join us this Friday for our next special guest, Sarah Ballantyne, the voice of Mary Jane Watson from the 1994 Spider-Man the Animated Series. You won't want to miss this episode. Hey, do you ask yourself who did that voice? Well, if you do, go to our website, www.whodidthatvoice.co, and click on the Episodes tab. Choose an actor, pick their name, and see pictures from the different characters they've voiced in their career. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time for more discoveries on Who Did That Voice.